ever wondered what it takes to pull off a miracle? Well, I guess it depends on who you ask. If you ask us, it needs a good acting, a hunting score, and a bit of help from above. Well, at least the lighting and the special effects. Hi, Shirley's fans. I'm Anne. You're watching Shirley's Plus History Behind the Curtain, where we give you a front row seat to the stories behind your favorite shows. And I'm Tonyo. In this edition, we'll be diving into a musical based on an iconic Filipino film, Himala, Isang Musical. First off, Tonyo, where did the idea for this Himala sa Entablado come from anyway? Well, oh, I remember, Anne, it came from that classic movie, the 1982 film Himala, and they would often show that original film during Holy Week. Right! So let's take a look first at the film that inspired the staged version. It's a relatively modern classic. So once in a while, there's this film that sticks in the minds of the public. And this is one of them. But there's more to it than the famous line delivered by the film's star, Nora Honor, at the climax of the film. Actually, that line, it was a meme before the notion of memes even entered the popular imagination, but its origins lie much deeper. While it was a product of the 1980s, the film and its eventual stage adaptation were inspired by a true story, well, depending again on who you ask, of something that happened only several years before. We traveled to December 1966 to the Lubang Islands in Occidental Mindoro. and the tiny island of Cabra on the northeast coast on this remote hilly plain and the tiny island of Cabra of the northeast coast on this remote hilly place a small chapel marks the spot where a schoolgirl said she saw something unusual one afternoon the girl Belinda Villas was with friends passing the hill simply called Burol and by a small tree or shrub she saw a woman they told their religion teacher, Paraluman Roque, who said to bring holy water the next day. They described the woman as hovering in midair and was dressed like a nun in a white with a blue veil. They assumed it was the Virgin Mary, for it did not leave after the girls threw holy water at the apparition the following day. So the day after, Roque held class on the hill with the girls and another lo and other locals soon heard the news and began praying, singing hymns, and gathering on the hill around the eight alleged visionaries. Belinda became the spokesperson, asking the mysterious spirit a few questions. So the apparition answered them in plain, simple Tagalog, affirming their question that she was the mother of God and calling herself the Immaculate Conception, which is an important title of the Virgin Mary. Now, the girls reported that Mary said that she, what she often does during visions, she said for people to return to the path of holiness and that a church be built on the site. But she was very specific because she said she wanted it to be 30 meters wide. So she said she wanted it to be this big and she was dressed in that blue veil and white dress. There's an image of Our Lady of Cabra. So this all ended in March 1972 as, a, as the subsequent politics of that year, especially the imposition of martial law that September. So imagine that um, kind of atmosphere during that time. They were the hottest news story, the martial law that happened. So the apparitions faded into obs obscurity. The girls, now women, went on to lead quiet, quiet separate lives. And on a side note, with these things, as is normal with these things, the Philippine Catholic Church, or any other religious group for that matter, has not made any official statements for or against the reported visions. But the islanders have fulfilled one of the Virgin's supposed requests. They have built the chapel that you see here that still stands on the hill, and the priest regularly leads services there for the people. In fact, you can see the statue of 
the virgin as described by the girls to the right side of the priest over there. Now, what to do with a story like that? Renowned actor. Now, what to do with a story like that? Renowned author, playwright, and screenwriter Ricardo Ricky Lee transformed this tale into an unforgettable film on faith, desperation, and social realities. He began work on the script as early as 1976, shortly after he was freed from detention in Fort Bonifacio for suspected membership in a subversive writer's group. Now, the film was produced by the Experimental Cinema of the Philippines, or ECP, and was released in 1982 despite tight controls of all mass media, including film by the state, which also imposed censorship. But as the ECP was a government-owned and controlled corporation that was dissolved after the 1986 revolution, it had no problem bankrolling the film for what at the time was 3 million pesos. Imagine that. In addition, then-President Marcos's daughter, Aini, who is now a senator, was head of the ECP, and the film was shot amongst the sand dunes in their home province of Ilocos Norte. Himala was even made the country's official entry to the February 1983 Berlin Film Festival. It was part of what can be called as the second age. Sec it was part of what can be called as the second golden age of, for Philippine cinema, which spanned the mid-1970s until the early, early 1980s. The ECP had called in the best of the best for the production. The Bicolana Nora Honor, who, like her character Elsa, was wildly popular with her legions of devotees, joined the late Ishmael Bernal in bringing Lee's script to life with her sparse dialogue and trademark expressive eyes. Uh, speaking of eyes, that reminds me of another faith-based work by the British actor Robert Powell when he played Jesus of Nazareth in a direct-to-television series of the same name from years before that. He eerily blinked only once during the entire production. Anyway... Bernal, fondly known as Bernie, is known for movies such as Maynila sa Kukunang Liwanag, Hinugot sa Langit, at Nunal and Nunal sa Tubig. Posthumously awarded by the state as National Artist for Cinema in 2001, he once commented, as you see there, on screen, that films are not just about the characters or the plot, but the society that surrounds them. It's not just what he said about Juan and Maria, but also the town that Juan and Maria lived in much as is the case with Himala, which is not just about Elsa, but also about Barrio Kupang, where they all live. So it was not only built as a blockbuster film with the brightest stars in Philippine cinema, but also touted as having thousands of extras. If ever you have seen Himala the film, it was really remarkable how many people there were, especially um, during the scenes that required to have the devotees present at the site. So the cast included Gigi Duenas as Nina, Laura Centeno as Chayong, Vanji Labalan as Aling Saling, Ama, Ama Ka Ama Kiambao as Sepa, Spanky Manikan as Orly, Joel Lamangan as Pari, and Pen Medina as Crispin Medina in the role of Pilo. Decades later, the film still wins awards and recognitions, including that one time it bagged the prize from CNN for the best film from the Asia-Pacific region. So... What about the music? So when we look at the musical, you see the story. And naturally, Ricky Lee himself was tapped by the Sandbox Collective and Nine Works Theatrical, which came together for this production, which is why the story and the feel of the stage adaptation closely follow the original film. So aside from Lee's text, veteran musician Vincent de Jesus served as the composer, lyricist, and musical director. In his notes for the 2019 run, the Jesus said the musical themes were based on their emotions and not just the usual personality that's more pop popular with other works. 
He also mentions basing the music from the native Filipino song form of Kundiman, giving it a twist with modern modern chord, chord progressions. In all, he avoided the usual stereotypes in crafting the music. They didn't even have microphones and only a piano accompanied by their haunting voices. I can still quote, I can still quote one of the lines recited or sung by Pare. Um, this is present in both both the film and the stage version. It's directly quoted. It's a direct quote. Um, this is when Elsa, Elsa starts talking to the town priest and they have this short interview of what she saw and he starts questioning her about it and then she ca he cautions her by saying something, uh, saying, Kung minsan nang demonyo nagpakita, minsan pakilala bilang hayop, minsan isa namang anghel, kung minsan kahit ang tatlong persona. So, just cautioning her that it might not be what she thinks it is. But I'm not as good as the stellar cast who sang all that, including Acel Santos, now Zambrano, she recently married, who was the usual Elsa with Celine Fabia alternating, Sheila Francisco and Between Escalante as Nanay Celine, of course that was her name in the musical adaptation, Naomi Gonzalez as Chayong, Kaki Teodoro as Nina, David Ezra as Orly, Vic Robinson III and Sandina Martin alternating as Pilo, Floyd Tena as Pari, and Alvin Maghanoy alternating with Sean Innocencio as Nistoy, and Hazel Maranan as his mother, Sepa. Actually, on another note, Sepa in the original film had two sons, but for the musical, they were, they were fused into a composite character, which is Nistoy. In the original film, they're two boys, and then... Now in the musical, they're just one son. And then what? Let's see what what other things did they change from the film? If you remember, I think from what I remember in the film, Chayong. Um, I think the part where Chayong is buried, uh -huh. so film he she was buried in a nicho niche nicho. Yeah. And then Chayong in the um, musical version is buried underground. Mm -hmm. Also, the character of Aling Pisin, um, if you remember in the film, she has this wild hair style and she's sort of, um, she's not quite there, if you know what I mean. Um, and she has, and she's shown in constant abject poverty. And in the film, the funeral procession is very large with all of the people of Barrio Kupang. But at the very end, you see Aling Pising wailing over her dead son who died of another disease that Elsa was not able to cure. And she was all alone there with just a couple of men carrying the tiny coffin of her son. This entire person and her own story was not in the musical at all. And I think there was something different with the police. Yeah, I think I remember that in the musical, the police played a minor role, but they are depicted in period accurate costumes. So, parang um, the police were barely there. Parang parang they. It seems like they were extras, but you know, just to fill in the scene. Pero so film. They were a big deal, and they they were like always present sa barrio kupa. Mm, true. Actually, I remember there was a time. I still I still vaguely remember when you said period accurate costume. I remember when they were still dressed in khaki brown with the um with the with the leather belt here. I forget the name of that. Sam Brown belt. Yeah, Sam Brown belt. The one with the strap here and everything. And the before they switched to the navy blue police uniform you see today, but I, I still kind of remember seeing them on TV as a young boy wearing the brown uniform you'd see in the original film and in the musical, which I, I like the touch, you know. It was a it was a nod to the fact it was the 1980s. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting period. Yeah. It puts the film, I it puts the musical into um into perspective or parang you would feel na oh okay so this is what the people were wearing this was 
what the police were wearing. So this musical is based on that timeline and not um, on the present day. Uh, but speaking of that, you know what's interesting too? I noticed it's, uh, well, in my experience at least, I don't really often see too many, um, I don't really often see too many music movies becoming musicals. I see the other way. I see it the other way around. It's like when That's true. when Le Miserable became a film. You know, when they do film, they always do film adaptations of a musical, which is very popular. I'm still waiting for the Wicked one. I don't know when that's coming. Up. But uh, this is for me an unusual case of the reverse, where. The film is transformed into the musical. I mean, we're blessed that Ricky Lee is there to go to do the transition. But usually, it's things like even Sound of Music. Sound of Music was originally a musical with Julie Andrews actually parodying it on a show before she was cast as Maria in the movie. So it's usually stage to screen, but this one is screen to stage. I mean, how often does that happen, really? I, I, can't, I can't off the top of my head name a particular case like this one. That's true. Even here, even here in the Philippines, you, would, you wouldn't notice like films being turned into musicals. Usually musicals and plays, they're like, they're on their own. You won't see um, movie adaptations of them or like see movie adaptations um, of musicals or the other way around. One other one I remember, oh my God, it's bringing all the Holy Week memories back. Uh, 1996, when uh, they had this movie called Cristo with starring Matt Ranilio III. Um, it was actually based on a regular Sinacula. I forget the exact title because every place has their own version and their own script. And they had a Sinacula that they transformed into a slightly, um, well, I saw I saw stage lights in one scene, so I'm like, why are they there? But um, into an interesting take on the Senacolo where it took place in pre-colonial Philippines. So that was weird. Roman soldiers around people you'd see from the Boxer Codex. It's a bit funny to look at that. But okay. And the Sea of Galilee was like, Lake Taal, so something like that. So anyway, but that was, again, that was stage to screen. So that's one of the far and few and far between instances of adaptations. And that movie had lots of different colors for people. But in this particular musical, I noticed that it was sort of, the film was sort of washed out, but I noticed two colors that stood out white and red for me oh i didn't really notice that but now that you mention it sipilo i think he, his staple was a red was a red sandal right yeah 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 Actually. and knowing knowing like the vibe of the himala stage during the musical everything was like you know, even when it's not so film, it was like washed out and everything. But because of the lighting of the stage in Himala, parang everything was sepia. It brings you back. It makes you feel like you're in another, you're in another place. So like, so it's a very warm tone. But then you see this pop of red from the clothes or from the props that they bring to the stage. I noticed, and they were talking in about it. Uh, the costume designer for the original film was talking about it. Um, they dressed like like what I'm wearing now. <laughs> they they dressed um, Elsa and her siete apostoles in white, which made them stand out. And the according to the head of the costume department at the time, she said that it empowered them from ordinary village folk to becoming, you know, voices of speaking for Elsa and her and her cause, her spiritual mission and all that. So it's 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 interesting how a costume change can suddenly change a character. That was really, that, I just found that really cool. That's true, that's true. But also um if you think about it, the color white symbolizes purity, doesn't it? So yeah. parang um the Shete Apostoles wearing white and Elsa wearing white makes them not only stand out, but then it symbolizes that they're pure and they're the one that 
um, that the Virgin Mary um, chosen to be um, the voice for the people. Because, of course, if Elsa wore black, I don't think anyone would mind her or anyone would believe her, right? So the color scheme, really, the, the costume color really is important. And then what you could see all of these details, if, you, if, you, if anyone watching this has seen the latest run, well, in 2019, before all this happened, um, there you'd see it's in the round, so I, it was very immersive. It was a, a very immersive experience. So there you have Elsa and one of the Siete Apostles, I don't know which one, in white. And everyone else is in different colors, but she is in white with a veil and all that. You know, very pious and all that. But it was in the round, so no matter where you're seated, you can notice, you notice that suddenly there's this group of white dre- dre- people dressed in white, and that's them. It's actually interesting na when they adapted it um, in 2019 and the previous adaptation to that, that it was in the round. Because as you said, na it was very close. The audience was very close to the stage. It felt more intimate and it felt like you were part of the stage. You were part of the story and you were part of them. You were literally in Kupang. So really, when I stepped into that stage... Because it was round, really goosebumps. Because the interior of the theater was black, and then the lighting was spot on with the sepia tones, warm tones, and then the stage really looked good. It made you feel like you were in another town. You weren't in Power Max Center. You weren't in Makati City, where they staged the last run. So yeah, but if you watch the the latest staging of Himala, you would be surprised to know that the first and other stagings of Himala back when, I think it was in CCP, it was actually in proscenium format. And then it was just recently that they turned it into a um, in the round and the black box layout, which made, which was really interesting. Actually, I felt like I was, one of those people on pilgrimage to see Elsa in Kupang. You know, it's like, oh my God, there's a healer. I want to see her. I felt like that. And especially the part where they were selling Elsa merchandise. In fact, I yes. have, I have, I have, I have this. Huh? That's really cool. I have this. It's, it's, it's literally, it's li- well, it's not a prop. Well, actually this, this abanico is both a prop used by some of the actors when they're you know playing pilgrims and they also sold it outside as a uh, merchandise it was really cool and they, they just really painted that this was like their mantra or something in both the film and the stage adaptation yeah. of you else the original else elsa fan devotees fan something like that but yeah because because it's a really hot place because kupang if you for those who don't know kupang was cursed with a drought after they supposedly drove away a leper who turned out to be the Virgin Mary. So she cursed the town by plunging them into an endless drought and endless days under the sun and no rain for years. So they always referred to the curse of Kupang, the sumpa sa Kupang. So fans were one of the best accessories you could sell to pilgrims, aside from other entertainment and a lot of re- religious articles, but you know, you gotta watch the film and see that. But they sold, they, they really made, the people of Barrio Kupang made money off Elsa's newfound status as a human. That's true. And now that um, now that you've shown the fan, I just realized, like literally just now, I realized that why does the fan says Elsa loves you? Weren't they just, you know, just a puppet or just like, not really a puppet, um, 
a prophet <laughs> of the Virgin Mary. Why does the fan says Elsa loves you instead of like, you know, the Immaculate Conception loves you? Because, you know, uh, Elsa's powers, supposedly powers, comes from the Virgin Mary and not Elsa herself. Elsa is just like a vessel of the per of the Virgin Mary. So why why are they worshipping Elsa instead of the Virgin Mary, right? Actually, good point. I just I didn't realize that until you brought that up. They he <laughs> mentioned one point when um she was being interviewed by Orly, who was a filmmaker from Manila who wanted to document what was going on. Uh, she said something along the lines of it is it's not I who do, does it, but the Virgin I the Virgin Mary's hands are the one who heals it. But then you notice I guess I guess they're the they venerate Elsa. These Mind you, she didn't tell them to write that. They just made yeah. merchandise for her. I think they did that because they felt she was their savior and they needed a savior figure. I mean, it's very common in, especially in our culture, we we, we love heroes, we love savior figures. Like if you go pre-colonial, there's always a culture hero in an epic or something like Lam Ang, he's the culture hero of the Ilocanos in his epic Biag Nilam Ang and you have similar characters in the Hinilawod and all that. Um, and then once they introduce uh, Christianity, then of course there comes the big savior figure, the Messiah. So, you know, Filipinos always look to a Messiah for salvation when they have, when times are tough. And Kupang was not just a small and poor and distant place. It was also a very hot and very hot and just, they were just thirsty, not just for water, but they were thirsty for a savior. And they were looking to Elsa, not just for rain or water, but politi political and economic gain. So I think yes. that's why they venerated her over the Virgin, who, interestingly, does not show up at all. There's only a statue. That's it. Nobody sees, no character appears in the film as the Virgin in Shining Light, whatever. Or in the musical as like a haunting voice. None of that. There's you don't. None of us see that. In fact, you, the only indication of Elsa seeing something is she just does this. Yes. Yep. And, and there's and, like the light, the yeah. light. Yeah, and we're not sure if she's playing or she's imagining things or she's actually seeing something. She, Nora Honor and Acel Santos and Celine Fabia, they all did a wonderful job of making you think she's really looking and communicating with something. Yeah. Whether, whether but, the character intended to or not. That's true. Because it, 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 it looks like, you know, writing me as a, as a semi-writer myself, it's like Elsa is the protagonist of the story. She's the main character, but and you're supposed to trust the main character. But then, if you really think about it, if you've seen like the film and the stage and everything, and like really thought about it, she's actually an unreliable narrator. She's an unreliable person in general. She's an unreliable character because, like, how are you so sure that? what you're what she's saying is true like where where's the where's the proof of everything like we only see her um kneeling and um praying praying but then does anyone seem really especially in the film like has anyone seen people actually being healed by elsa like I don't think they've shown it. And it's part of the storytelling of the film. Like it says how it says like even though people are flocking there to be healed by Elsa, it's because of their desperation. They're desperately clinging on to something that might heal them because they've lost all hope. So like or how are we so sure <laughs> that Elsa is really healing them? Actually, I have a feeling some of the people who were healed, of course, in the in universe, okay, in universe, I have a feeling some of the people who were healed were through the placebo effect. Yeah, you know, they go there, they get healed, like they drink the holy water. She, she, in both versions, 
she gets water and blows on it and prays over it or something. And that's considered holy. And then that's given to sick people to drink. And that cures them allegedly of everything from kidney problems to infertility. I don't know, all sorts of things. So then, then in come, then in the musical, but it's also shown in the film, there's even one character who specifically mentions, I can't walk. He sings the yes. part. I'm in a wheelchair and he says, his, his is the last one in a chorus of voices. And it, it struck me because his was the only voice ringing and he ends that verse of the song by saying, and I can't walk in Tagalog. I forget the exact lyrics, but he says, and I can't walk. So I don't, I didn't see him walking after that. So I don't know. Yeah. But, other people, it wasn't shown. Mrs. Gonzalez in the film was a devotee after seeing that. And she was, I guess she was healed because after that she became one of the Siete Apostoles and she was like really into it. Yeah, she really devoted everything. She threw her that. into it. So it's, 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 it's really, it's an interesting commentary because... Um, Bernal's films were also social commentary. They mm-hmm. tended to social commentary and they explored social issues at a time where a lot of these things were not exactly uh, for public discussion. So they discussed things such as uh, blind faith in a leader, um, curing, curing, curing yourself from Ill- being cured from illnesses. In fact, going back to the police just a bit, I remember in the film they mentioned something about the. Sorry if I'm giving the English lines because I don't remember the Tagalog, the pre- precise Tagalog lines. I remember the subtitles, but you, there's something about that later. Um, the policeman says something about the police chief of overseeing Kupang says something like in towards the climax in one of the big group meetings of her devotees. He says something like, uh, "If anyone talks, if anyone talks garbage about." God, the government, or me, shoot them. He says something like that. He says something like that to an underling. And, well, you have to watch the film and the musical. But he says something like that. So it does show a sense of tightness in terms of censorship, but then there's still that over overflowing yearning for somebody to come out with the truth and a miracle essentially really and i realized that this film and the music the stage musical really proves that art really is political like you might not be able to say it directly by writing or you know by saying your thoughts out loud but then making art you know this film this musical it's like a very, very amazing art piece, but and yes, it is political. And the funny thing was, I've spoken to some actors, and they said that they considered the message of the musical timely, which was also timely in the film when the film was made, because there was, of course, that sentiment at the, in that period. Ironically, despite the fact that it was state produced. But even in the present day, 2019, 2020, 2021, the film's message of blind faith, trust in that, and being enlightened to form your own critical thoughts is, and looking around you for even the smallest things to be miracles, very timely, very timely. Because there are skeptics in the group, and they're also the fanatic devotees, the fanatical devotees of Elsa. So the skeptics are the ones trying to maintain order in Kupang. I remember that. And those include Nimia. And even though it's a religious event, the priest, he keeps waking, telling people, hey, just because someone called themselves a prophet of God doesn't mean they are. Are you sure? And that goes back to the thing I was saying earlier, that uh, Elsa, what you probably saw, might not even be the Virgin Mary. It could be something wrong which does happen once in a while because that's how they operate according to religious doctrine. They appear as things that you would fall for. So there is that question of blind faith and the message is as timely as ever. That's, that, that's for, that for me is the measure of a good 
piece, good piece of art. If it still rings true from the day it was shown to the public to the day that you saw it years after, if its message still rings true, then it's really that good. Whether it's a book, a film, statue, whatever, if you still if you still get the message years later and it's still clear to you, and if it resonates, then that means it did its job. Kinda off topic, but I remembered the part where you said, you know, there's always this skeptics and believers uh-huh. in the musical and in the film. I actually attended one of um direct hmm. um direct. Laxon's um, workshop. Me and my friend were there, and then he dissected um, scenes from the musical, and then did did he did some directing cues and how they built that scene. And then he he, I remember him telling us that you know how it was in the round, and during the film, uh, during the part where um, Elsa is is healing people. You would notice that the skeptics are in only one side, and the opposite of them are the believers. They don't mix together. So you would notice now, oh, this you're sure that this part is the believers and this part's um this part of the stage were the skeptics, and they don't mix at all. Oh, I did not I I, I did not catch on to that when I watched that. I always thought that the only people like the believers would just gather around Elsa, but I did not know that there was a clear delineation between skeptics and believers. I mean, character-wise, yes, but I did not see that physical separation in the beginning. And because there were some scenes that it's just masses of people and yeah, it's, it's, it's chaos. There's <laughs> of chaos in that musical. It's yeah. really interesting. And, um, and it's funny because, again, back to what you said about being in the round and it, how immersive it was, the seats were constructed in such a way that, okay, you have the bleachers, you have the seats, and they are under wooden shacks, like bare shacks yeah. that on a normal hot day would barely protect you from the sun. So, you know, you felt like you were one, you really felt like you were one of the thousands that showed up. Like, you were one of the thousands of extras in the movie who showed up to see Elsa and in all her, you know, prophet healer, glo- miraculous glory. So, and it's just really funny, even side characters would, you know, they would sell merchandise. And the cool thing I found out was they even had their own little dialogue. They weren't just mumbling stuff. If you were beside one of them, if you were lucky enough to be one of, beside one of them, because... Uh, especially really- especially when you're towards the back. Yeah. The one near the walls. Like, you're not at the front row. Because I've experienced that. I was on the, like, very far back. And then, yes, I could hear the mumblings. I was like, when I first watched Himala and then I heard the mumblings because I was on the far back, I was like, what? Well, I was like, where did that come from? I was like, am I hallucinating things? <laughs> really, it was an experience. Maybe, I was like, what? <laughs> we're getting apparitions too. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> which really? the, sorry, which the priest, which... Well, I kind of look like the guy. Um, <laughs> uh, he asks the question to ito bay aparisyon o isa lamang bang ilusyon? So, right. he asks that crucial question in one of the numbers where everyone's starting to get wind of the the apparition or the supposed yeah. miracle and they're, they're, the, the, the town's whispering to each other. You know, you know, in movies where something happens and the, the town starts gossiping about it, it's that yeah, scene. Like... Yeah, it's that scene. <laughs> but the thing is, the gossip is so unique to them. In fact, I found out from one of the cast ensemble, each of them have a name. It's not listed in the souvenir program. You won't see it, but each of the, the ensemble members have names and jobs and descriptions and occupations and if you if you're if you listen close enough they talk about what's relevant to their character they talk in character in their own individual way so each of them has a tiny story arc all woven into the fabric that is the entire musical so that's really cool 
that's actually what I like, what I love about the musical version of Himala. It's the attention to detail. Like, you know, you would think that small details don't matter, but then at the end of the day, as you walked out of the theater, you're like, oh my God, that's a big brain move. Like, you know, it's what gives you the goosebumps when you're like, oh my God, I got that reference. Like, they stay true to the to the story but also the details like there's no details left behind like as you said that every ensemble has their own story has their own name and it's not just you know as a characterization for for the for the acting to look good but also it's the details like you know just I can't say anything more, but guys, the details of the musical, yes. it's just mind blowing. <laughs> Actually, the character, I, the, the sub character, the name, the, the secret name character, for lack of a better term, that I remember, is also named Tonya, like me. Um, and I think he was the Taho vendor of, the, of, of Kupang or something like that. But there was a character named Tonya, and he was making lako. Naglalako siya ng or something, magtatako siya. So, I think, something like that, if I recall correctly, or he was he was selling something in particular. So, see, even that particular Ansan character, he would be singing in chorus with everybody, but he also had his own individual thing going on. Each of them had that, aside from the larger characters. And it was really cool. In fact, oh my God, the detail, you're right, the detail, to, it was, wow, the detail was like, crazy good like all the characters did their stuff correctly like we'll, but we'll delve into that in the trivia section but yeah the detail props for that it's amazing and hands hashtag, down, you hands down. Watch it. you're not sure where you're gonna end up sitting unless you i mean you have your general yes you have, we have the general seating areas you know like ticket price for this one that one and so on but it was random to a certain extent, first come, first served. So yeah. you really never quite know. You won't know, know where right? you're, you're seated. Like, I've been seated on, if it's a, imagine it's a box like that. I've been seated on both these ends of the stage. So I've been, like, the first time I watched it, I was, if you enter, it's to your right hand side i watched on i watched it there and then the second time around i watched it on this other side in a from a slightly higher angle so i'm like okay so i saw certain things i heard different things that i didn't yes catch the first time around you would it, it was just really really cool to do that and even the props they had i think i don't know how they did the i think it was real grass talaga. yeah i think yeah, I think it was real dried grass. So I felt like I really remembered the film, and not just the film, but the province. I remember hot summer days in the province, hot holy weeks in the province, and the dust that would just blow up in your face, and the dried grass on the road because it's the it's a really hot time of the year. I felt all of those just seeing the dried grass and the, the way, like you said, the, the whole thing was was in warm, sepia-ish lighting. So I felt the summer heat, even though yes. it was cold theater. Yeah, it, it was cold inside. <laughs> but then you would like, the the, the the warm lighting, like like my lighting right now, it's like very yeah. warm. <laughs> and, and it was cold inside. Yes. And, and you'd see, and it doesn't help, but you know how people say it, you know, na inita ako sa mo when you're wearing something like a like what like what you're wearing and then it's outside but you're like no I don't feel warm at all but then people are saying na inita ako sa mo. I kind of felt that too because the people of Kupang were dressed for the hot for hot weather even though it was a really cold place they were performing in so yeah they were dressed for the heat and and I distinctly remember because it was like really cold inside the theater like as all theaters are and then. They were like fanning themselves, like I don't yeah. know And yeah. then I was so amazed because they literally had sweat on them. I don't know how they did yeah. that, but they looked sweaty. They looked humid. They like they look really like 
hot fanning themselves and there's like droplets here and everything. That's right. They look tired and everything. I mean, they would do things like processions around the town or something and they would walk around and do all these random things. They would just sit down and go, you're right. They even had tiny beads of sweat. That, that, yeah. was, that was cool. For, for a lack of English term, and I'm sorry, but they look malagkit. Para silang naglalagkit because it's so humid. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. I, I honestly, the the vibe of the film was beautifully translated to the stage. Yes, yes. I mean, usually you'd look again at how, like, say, the Mizrab went from because I watched I watched the stage one and the movie, and you know you'd say you'd compare how they do it on stage and then how they did it, and you know they did this and did that, but then. This one, the reverse is just as good. The reverse is just as good if it's done by the right people. Of course, it helped that, again, it helped that Ricky Lee was still involved. And yes. I got to meet him, oh my God. Because I loved him ever since I was so young. Because they'd show it every year and it always caught me attention. I forget when I started watching it. But when I met Ricky Lee, I'm like, thank you for this wonderful story. Thank you for this wonderful thing. It's not just iconic, it's beautiful. But it's speaking of details, we can go to, you know, the trivia section. Because there's tons of tiny the details. fun section. There's tiny <laughs> things that you may or may not have noticed about the musical or the film. Okay, so... Now, some trivia for our listeners and watchers about both the musical and the film that inspired it. So, first of all, the chaotic climax from the film, if you've watched the film, that was just shot in one take. Ishmael Bernal was on, was a cherry picker for that scene. And especially if you've seen if you've seen the the climax, the chaotic climax of the film, it involved hundreds, I, I don't think it's thousands, but hundreds of people congregating into that open area. And then I, I think there was rain as well. Like the ending scene, it was raining. And then they, of course, they couldn't like, if somebody made a mistake, you couldn't just, you know, redo redo everything again so they had to make it perfect like even today if i would like imagine a himala um chaotic climax like i would also want it to be one take it would be more, more raw and more genuine that way i for me it would turn out that way and the you know, directed el bernal was really good at that and they really did it in one take. That was like, when I read it, I, I'm not sure if I read it or like I watched it in the documentary. I was like, really? And Nora Honor's acting was so chef's kiss. She did that in one take. <laughs> Actually, now that you mentioned it, it was tough. It would be tough to do it in several takes because part of the, some of the scenes show in the final chaotic climax like statues and and wheelchairs and random things were broken. So you can't just, okay, let's bring in the next prop. You know, we didn't do it right. Let's bring in another prop to ruin it or whatever, to trash it. They literally had only one chance to trash the place. Yeah. And and I saw raw footage in the documentary. There's a documentary on it called Himala Ngayon um, by ABS-CBN. Uh, film restoration because they they resto- they, dig- they digitally restored the film, and they did a documentary on it and its present day impact. And they showed behind the scenes raw footage. And wow, as soon as Bernal said action, the crowd just lost it. It was amazing. It's, I felt like, oh my god, if I were there, I would have run for the hills too. I'm like, no, yes. no, I'm the, gonna get really. Out of in fact, I wonder if people like, actually got hurt. Yeah, because, you know, um, the story really banks on mass hysteria, I think. Mass 
this area and that screams mad. I think if I was one of the cast uh, extras on that scene, then people would just start randomly screaming and running. I, I too would run for my life. I too was like, ah! <laughs> And then the actress, the actress who played, um, the actress who played Aling, Aling Saling, si, um, si Banji, she also mentioned that she ran in the direction of a cameraman that was all to herself. It wasn't, he wasn't focused on other people. So you could see her in the film holding her chinelas for some reason. I don't know. And running in a tizzy going to that cameraman and she was just, she just lost it. So, I, I mean, even Basta, just watching the raw footage as an action and then everyone's, ah! it's really alarming. So I don't know how people did it with a straight face. Not because it's funny, but because it's borderline terrifying. Yeah, it's scary. Like, I, I'm sure, I'm sure they probably told, okay, some of you run here, some of you run there, whatever. But even if, like you said, even if I were in the cast, I'd be confused to like, wait, uh, panic mode on. <laughs> panic mode on. Anyway, so what else did they, what else do we remember? Ah, Nora Honor, the original Elsa in the denim jacket right there, watched the 2018 run. So it's really cool to see Acel Santos, Zambrano, Elsa, and the original Elsa. I mean, it's that cool to see. I don't know if I were if I were part of the cast, it'd be like, oh my god, that's amazing. I would totally fanboy if that was me because it's her, it's Elsa, the the one who the original Elsa. I mean, the originator of the the role. It's it's. I don't know what she said exactly. What went inside? What went on inside her head about that? But. It must be interesting for her to see a musical adaptation of something that she was so that she's so known for and was so involved in, especially in her not early in her career. She was already a star, but in that part of her career when she was literally the cinematic Elsa, because she was again, she had, like you said earlier, she had legions of devotees. Like even even our family cook was a Noranian to the max that someone commented about Nora about you know I don't like Nora and she cried <laughs> she cried my dad told me that when they were younger she she was she was there and somebody said something about Nora that she didn't like and she literally ran to the kitchen because she was crying because she loved Nora so much I mean to a certain extent Nora mirrored Elsa and Elsa mirrored Nora because both were like had these fans, these devotees, these intense, these intense, passionate followers. So it's really amazing how Nora was able to watch Elsa. And it must be a little unnerving to see your character there after playing. Because, yeah. you know, people sometimes don't watch the work they did. So mm -hmm. it must be very interesting for you to finally watch, not quite you, but I'm sure she's seen the film of many times. Yeah. Um, it's it might be interesting to watch a sort of you, an alternate ego of yourself, in a different format. So that must have been cool. I don't know. That must have been cool. And of course, Nora sang too. So you know, musical. So that must be interesting to see it in a musical format, not just a straight play. Let's see. Uh, she watched it in twenty eighteen. Oh, I Let's think. See. Before, before ABS-CBN released, released the digital restored version, the print of the film used for broadcast had both English and Japanese subtitles. So you can actually read the Japanese characters written vertically on the right hand of the screen. Uh, yeah, I, I, I actually kind of remember that. Yeah, I was like, well, why is it all... It looked handwritten. The subtitles, like... You, you see on the screen now, it's not it's uh, the digitally restored version, but it was cleaned of that. I don't know how they did it. It's amazing. But um, I remember the English titles were printed, but for some reason, the Japanese ones were handwritten. I guess it was because it was shown in 
that film festival the following year. So I remember they kept that particular version over and showed it. That's the one I remember seeing every year with the Japanese. And when I eventually could read some Japanese, it's like, oh, okay, it says Elsa. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like that. Okay. So it, it followed the dialogue. But it was it was just interesting to see Japanese. Okay. And I did not know you could put Japanese subtitles side by side with English ones like that because I'm used to anime where it's all at the bottom or something like that. Anyway, uh, so again from that scene you saw earlier, Nimia and Elsa in Chayang's grave. Um, speaking of the restored version, actually, it's clearer when you see that picture of Chayang's grave. The cross indicates that the story occurs in the hot summer months. So there you see it. It's clearer now. April 28th, she was b- born April 28th, 1958, and died on the 30th of June, 1982. So the events happened around June to July, and maybe from April, if that was early months ago or something. And Elsa, she says she was a foundling. She was Ampon. When even the pari knows that she was Ampon because he calls her putok sabuho in both the film and the stage version. Although in the stage, mu- in the musical, uh, Floyd Tennant does a really sort of uh, forceful way of saying it. But Joel Lamangans is more uh, maluman, for lack of a better term. But it's a little more forceful in the musical version when he says something like, Ikay tinutok song putok sabuho. Something like that. So, yeah. So Elsa was a founding, but she, in both versions, she does say that she was born in 1958. So she's almost the same age as Chayong. We just don't know when she was born because she was just found on the hill. But she's the same age as Chayong, and they would be, what, 60-something if they were real people and lived until now? They would be they would be 60-something. So they would be seniors already. They would probably get better benefits at Kupang. I don't know. Maybe Barrio Kupang would give them better senior citizen benefits. Yeah, but in the musical, only Elsa's birth year is mentioned when Orly interviews her. Also, the grave cross reveals more about Chayong, not just, you know, her uh, date of birth and her date of death. Her real name. Her real name was revealed as Maria Rosario Gabu. Gabu? Gabu? Gabu. Everyone else in the in both the film and the musical are only known by their nicknames, generic titles, or surnames, which like is really interesting because yeah, I would think about like Elsa, 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 no last name, Aling Saling, and her Shete Apostoles, all just you know last a blur of last names and nicknames. Like there's not really like the official name given to them. And even Nimia, Nimia is a name, but her father is this cr- called Igming Bugao. Yeah. He's just Igme and he's a Bugao. That's it. And uh, everyone's like, there's Mrs. Gonzalez, there's Mrs. Alba. They don't have names. And then even, even the priest is just called Pare. That's it. He's not called Father This, whatever. He's just Pare. And Everyone's either aling this, manung that, or nobody has a search. She's the only one with a full name. I, I, I don't know. That's that's the interesting thing. I, I found I found that interesting too, actually. Now that you mentioned it, she's the only one with the full name. Why? Well, aside from the fact that it's part of the story, I don't know why she in particular has that name. But yeah, come to think of it, Chayo Rosario. Okay, yeah. I've, I've kind of heard I've kind of heard people named Rosario called Chayo, Chayo, Chayo. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a Filipino thing. I don't know. We yeah, know. it is a Filipino thing. Like your your real name is so far away from your nickname. Yeah. It's like where did that come from? But a little bit into colonial history, since this is a history blog. <laughs> It's only in the 1800s when people actually got legit surnames. Because oh, that's true. That's true. Remember that? The Catalogo de los Apellidos. Yeah. The, the book of the, the catalog of uh, surnames by um, General Claveria. 
if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And the edict requiring everyone to get a surname. But before that, people were just known as basically the same thing that the characters of Barrio Kupang were. Igming Bugao, uh, Tayo. Well, and usually based on what you look like, right? Yeah. They would call you on what you look like. Like, and that's your name. Yeah, they just call you whatever your surname. Your your surname tended to be... I mean, they had other systems before the Spaniards yeah. arrived. In the colonial period, you were you were, you were Juan Taba or, or Maria, Mariang Duling. I don't know, something like that. But they, and, then, and then they only standardized surnames in the 1830s because the governor said, you know, the governor general said, you know what? It's so hard to tax all these people. Let's just make sure everybody has a surname. So some of those nicknames stuck with people and today they still bear those surnames. And others could prove they used the surname for a, a long time time several generations so they they were allowed to keep that surname and then i remember anecdotally that some places or islands islands or towns they would all begin with the same letter, same letter. yes yeah. you know, like parang town this town everybody was just dumped with the surname that started with the letter f fernandez yeah. feriol something like that so i've i've heard about that i was like when when I was, you know, out with my parents, with my relative, relatives, and we meet new people, and they're like, oh, what's your last name? And they were like, Naldoza. Oh! And then they be, they would immediately like, oh, Iloilo. And it was like, the younger me was like, how did you know? <laughs> how did you know we were like from Iloilo? And then they're like, it was really amazing. And then I asked my mom, and then she was like, oh, because usually... Um, um, surnames with the same first letter usually comes from the same island, so probably they know a bunch of N last names from that island, so they they assumed it was from Iloilo and something like that. And when I grew up, um, I'm actually taking Philippine arts right now, so I have like a lot of history subjects and whatnot, and and I'm not sure how true it is, but I it stuck with me that you know, Claveria's book of surnames. They used to just, you know, rip off pages and then, you know, okay, this this is the governor of wow. this place. And then they're like, okay, this is the surnames for your town. So that's how they had, you know, similar last names, similar starting last names because it was ripped from a page and then like, you know, all the N names are there and all the M names are there. So that's why it's like, you know, the same place. That's amazing because mine is Santos. It's so generic. <laughs> it's one of the more common ones. But my mother's maiden name is a native one. So we're, we're, we're very sure, long, long story short, we're very sure that everybody comes from the same ancestor, but there are tons of us that don't know each other anymore. But we're definitely sure we're from the same province, same bloodline. Even my dad's descended from that family on several generations back. So I'm like, wow, okay, I'm from that family, both sides. So, but Santos, it's so funny. We don't, I've asked so. I've given up asking people like, are you Santos? Oh, from which province? From Bulacan, we're from Bulacan. So I'm like, Bulacan, where? Where in Bulacan? I'm so excited. I'm like, maybe you're related. And then they go, oh, from this town. Okay, wrong town. No, no. Maybe a distant, distant relative. <laughs> I don't know. So I kind of gave up asking people. And then there's this story that my grandfather, it was a double surname, then he just chopped it to Santos. And I'm like, okay, whatever. This is ridiculous. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I, I, I just gave up asking. Anyway, so yeah, interesting thing about Chayong having the only phone name, Gabu, Gabu. I don't know where that's from, but... In fact, Kupang's not even a certain place. They shot it in Ilocos Norte, but it could be it could be, you know, if there's if there's any town USA, Kupang is your typical town. It could have been anywhere. That's true. Especially in the Philippines, you know, there's this, I know. Sorry. Especially in the Philippines, you know, it's it's pretty generic. The way they pr- portrayed Kupang, it's like a generic province, a generic rural area. Yeah. Like, it could fit in anywhere. And as you know, Philippines is a tropical country. So, 
every thing every place that you could think of it's probably gonna be hot in the summer but yeah i mean watching the film and watching the musical nainitan din ako it felt like it was burning yeah and if, the lighting for both was either bright or like you said warm and you could really feel it was hot yeah. i mean i mean it wasn't really hot either way but you know it felt really you could feel the heat oppressive heat yeah that's the that's the term yes. oppressive heat i could feel the humidity with their lighting i was waiting for a migraine to come on <laughs> cuz i get triggered by heat my, by the heat so um cuz i in bulacan also sometimes i go home there and it's hot it's a hot dusty quiet town and after i come and then when i come back here to manila it's a full blown migraine i'm like i'm tired good night everybody i don't want to talk to anyone so but all i can infer from kupang from the film at least was uh tourists especially foreigners have easy access that's one because there were there were american tourists in both the film and the stage adaptation and two it's connected to a larger town because in the end the ambulance brings elsa to a large a hospital so the road leads to a larger town somewhere else so it must be a bar it's a, and it's called a barrio so it's not called a town it's called a barrio so it must be a barangay attached to a much larger town but a far flung barangay yeah it's probably the outskirts already like the geography of ilocos shows mountains and everything but um i guess beyond those mountains beyond that road where they take they take her off that's probably where the main town and municipio and the church and all that that's where all of it lies and i think with that yeah and i think it's near enough because i think it was from the movie it was shown that nimia took a bus and also orly they took a bus from manila to kupang so i think it's like you know very near for it to, to be able to be accessible by bus so i'm guessing it was luzon because i don't know well you can yeah. take a walk to the bisayas but it takes a day two days to yeah. you now i don't know either one but yeah kupang could be anywhere but those are that, that i always imagined that it was connected to a much larger settlement but yeah um hmm oh speaking of nimia you mentioned nimia about names in nimia her cabaret was in the musical was called disco heaven and it had flickering lights and it was really cool and In, but in the film it had a different name that the boys were peeking into it was called midnight heaven and the sign was blue the sign was just blue light blue it said midnight heaven and it didn't really have the fancy lights but it had the nice lights inside and everything but you know it was just called midnight heaven and it was uh the walls were made of sawale um mm. woven, woven palm i guess that's the english yeah. word sawale so Um yeah but in in the musical it was changed to disco heaven and it had a flickering the sign had flickering lights and it was really cute. So I mean if I were in Kupang I would have gone there for a good time too. True. I, mean, I would have I would have had a nice beer and then you know chatted with people just because it's the only nightlife they have. Yeah. Also I I remember Like David Ezra, who played Orly in the musical, he actually used an actual vintage film camera as part of um, as a prop for scenes where he was filming the events in Kupang. When I first watched the the musical, I was like, "Wow, that's really like such a cool prop!" Like I thought it was like you know a fake one because you know where can you get um that kind of vintage camera like see 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 the photo right there it's like really really vintage and then i think he mentioned it somewhere and then it's like oh, wow that's an actual camera so really i as i've said the attention to details guys the attention to details it was an actual vintage film camera 
it's the one because I remember in the film from that period, the cameras were the wind up sort mm-hmm. with the lenses that you had to rotate or something. I don't know. I don't. I don't know how that works honestly. And I wonder if uh, David Ezra was instructed on how to operate the camera yeah. for the part. And side note, I like how he dressed. For me, his was the closest to Spank to to the film. For me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw I saw Spanky on the film and I was like because I I watched the musical first before the movie. And then I was like when I saw the movie, I was like, wow, that's exactly what David was wearing as or music. Like, this is so accurate. Like, oh my god. Even down to the checkered scarf thing. I'm like, yes. Oh my god. It's I think up. also the also the bandana, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it was the fashion of the day, but yeah. He, he, he looked, as, I mean, aside from a few other characters, he looked the closest to the, the, the film. That was, that was cool. And oh, here's another funny one. This one that last found really funny, and we also. We, we were laughing when we when we when we dug this up. Um, fans, oh my gosh! Fans of the musical even created a role playing universe or RP verse on Twitter. It featured some of the musical's key characters, including Elsa, Ninia, Orly, and Pare. The cast found out apparently and shared the tweets of the RP verse amongst themselves. So there you could see there's Orly, there's Elsa, there's Ninia, there's the priest, and they're all they. They all interacted, or something like that. I, re- I mean, I read some of it, and the the people behind it all interacted in character. So, it's a film from the nineteen eighties that became a musical in the modern period, in the contemporary period, and suddenly they took it on social media and they made fan work of it on an entirely new platform that nobody in nineteen eighty two could have ever imagined existed. That's like that's so mind blowing to think about. Now that you've mentioned it, I was like, you know, that's like it's interesting how also art evolves from mm. the use of film on the first on the movie. The film was used because digital wasn't really um, used back then, and then the the film was digitalized, and then. It was adapted into a musical in a proscenium style, you know, the traditional style. A few years or maybe even a decade after, I think, I think it was adapted into a box, um, black box style, on the round style, which is like a completely different approach. And now with the um, with the use of social media, now that there there is the rise of the social media, we see the RP. RP verse of these characters, which was like really mind blowing when I first saw it on the because you know I was really active on social media. You know, hey guys, you gotta watch Himala, buy tickets now. And then suddenly, this account pops up. I was like, what? What? What is this? At first, I was like confused, like what? I thought it was run by the you know the actual people by Himala, but then apparently it wasn't. So it was like a cool progression of um the art and un- from the past until now so actually now that you mentioned it you're right i thought it wasn't a marketing ploy by the producers or the, the stage companies or anybody um because even the actors were surprised and they were sharing it in their group chats i remember they told us they were sharing it in their group chats and everything like that and they were exchanging the tweets. And when I read the tweets, it's like, oh my God, they, they remember parts of the they remember parts of the musical. They remember they interact as if they're in character. I mean, for those who aren't aware, role playing is done essentially by a person in character on social media or on some platform. And they basically interact with each other in character, dive, everything from dialogue to characteristic, it's basically like acting. So they, it's like- Yeah, acting. literally role-playing. <laughs> it's funny how, it, it's just cool that there's role-playing for Filipino works. I mean, like- Yeah, I, it's it's hope, very uncommon. I hope there's one for Trece soon. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> for those who haven't seen it, it's an 
It's a based on Philippine mythology. I hope someone does it soon. Trese, come on, RP people out there. But yeah, also it's... their interactions were very funny. Like I've seen tweets, tweets between Nimia and Orly. They're like cat and dog, and then they're like so funny with each other. It's like, oh my god, I need more. I need more interaction. Like this is the interaction we never had in the musical, of course. True. <laughs> It it spawns it spawns an uh, uh, extrapolation, for lack of a better term. It spawns extrapolation of the plot, and it's really interesting because I guess they were confined to the time period of just the, the musical. They weren't. They didn't go beyond like a sequel or whatever. It seemed like they were just operating in in that universe, in that universe of you know just the time period. Like I said. Appears to have happened between latest April to uh, mid July because of the date of uh, Chayong's uh, death. So, because of the date of Chayong's death, which is sort of like uh, maybe three fourths of the way into the story, seventy five percent of the way in. Um, I think that was. I think that was. Um, what do you call this? I think that was more or less the timeline because things happen. Some parts happen in weeks. Some things happen in days in the original film. So I would say safe bet is about April to July 1982, which at the time was um, present. So really, it's it's exposing a lot of truth, isn't it? I mean, the musical is really about truth, and what 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 is the truth? You know, um, yes, quid, quid is veritas, yeah. That's the Latin of it. Blind, also blind devotion or blind following, right? It's about yeah. that. Yes, it, and I like one of their numbers they mentioned. Basically, the message of the, one of their numbers was looking for the. Do you really need a sign from heaven to consider something a miracle? And you can only need you need only look around you to see miracles every day. So, even just waking up, some people would say even just waking up is a miracle. So, I think that's the message of this play, which is a miracle in and of itself, phenomenal, and it's nothing short of miraculous, despite whether because of all the people that came together to make it possible from the 1980s to the present day. So, truth can be a bit stranger than fiction, especially when the miracle of the stage has roots in the cinematic classic and ultimately an obscure story of a 